All right. <clears throat> so it was the last chapter, of course, in the book of 1 Kings. We're closing out our, our Wednesday night Bible study with 1 Kings tonight. Chapter 22 is kind of a long chapter. We've got a few things going on here. So let's dig right in here. Verse number 1, the Bible says, And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Now I'm going to pause right here because I mentioned this before and we've, we've gone and looked at Chronicles in the past because it's parallel passages with 1 Kings, 2 Kings, you have 1 and 2 Chronicles and they cover a lot of the same events but you actually get a little bit more information. You get kind of a, a more complete picture when you're seeing everything that happens when you put them side by side. So um, just a little note, if you haven't done this already, at, with many places in the Bible, I would recommend doing not just Bible reading, but also doing Bible studying. And your Bible reading, you should be doing anyways, but Bible studying is a little bit separate where you where kind of start to take the pieces of the puzzle together and, and match them up and line them up. You should, you know, lining up the four Gospels, a great idea, is a great way to learn and get the full picture of everything that happens using all the details given amongst the various Gospels. Uh, books like this, you know, all the parallel passages books, kind of putting them side by side and, and seeing what you can learn from them. It's a really good thing to do. So we're going to uh, keep your finger here. Turn, if you would, to Second Chronicles chapter 18. I'm going to get a little bit more information about Jehoshaphat here showing up to King Ahab. Because basically what happens at this point in the story Jehoshaphat shows up and King Ahab, you know, it says there was peace between Israel and Syria for three years. But Ahab's just kind of like itchy and he's looking at this land. Ramoth Gilead's like, don't you know? I mean, Ramoth Gilead's really our land. And Syria was, excuse me, occupying Ramoth Gilead. And he's saying, that's our land. You know, we should just go and take it. And it's like, he's just got this itch. He wants to go back and, and, and take control of that land again. And, of course, Jehoshaphat's there and he brings this up because he wants Jehoshaphat to go and fight with him. He's trying to get some extra military, you know, um, advantage over Syria by, by getting other people to yoke up with him and to go down. But one of the things that's interesting about Jehoshaphat, well, we know Ahab's a wicked king. We just, we've established that already in the previous chapters. He is a wicked king and um, not godly, always worse than, you know, all the ones that were wicked before him. And uh, last week we heard about how he basically took Naboth's vineyard and, you know, killed him for it and everything. And, uh, but he did end up humbling himself at the end of that chapter last week. So he humbled himself before God, but he's still a wicked king. And, um, but we're going to learn a little bit more about the relationship because it's not mentioned here in 1 Kings 22 between Ahab and Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a righteous, godly king. He was the king of Judah. Right, the southern tribe, the southern kingdom of Judah, Jehoshaphat's ruling and reigning there, while Ahab is reigning in the northern, the bigger kingdom of Israel. Look at verse number one of Second Chronicles 18. The Bible says, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. So what that means by joined affinity, it means he married like one of Ahab's daughters and became Ahab became his father-in-law. So when he's joining affinity with them, he's, they're, they're joining houses together. So he's yoked up now with Ahab being his father-in-law. And, and, you know, again, with the politics and everything else, it's just a real messy situation that he never should have gotten involved with from the beginning. Something he shouldn't have done. But um, let's keep reading here. Verse number two, it says, And after certain years... He went down to Ahab to Samaria, which is exactly what we're reading about in 1 Kings 22. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people he had with him and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. So what we're going to see in 1 Kings 22, you don't get all this information of how he's like, I mean, he's really buttering him up. He's like, he's killing all these, you know, really treating, you know, rolling out the red carpet for him when he shows up to visit and just, and, and, laying all these gifts out for him. Well, all he really wants him to do is go to war with him, to, to join up with him and, and yoke up to go fight Syria, which, what did Judah have to go fight Syria for? Nothing. It's not their battle. It's not their fight. They have no business going there. And we'll see in a little bit, a little bit later in my sermon, Josh ends up getting rebuked 
for helping out the ungodly. I mean, because Ahab is a wicked king. He never, he had no business going and helping him out at all. Verse number three, though, in 2 Chronicles 18 says, And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Joshua, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people is thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Therefore the king of Israel gathered together of prophets, 400 men and said unto them, Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides, that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he never prophesied good unto me, but always evil. The same as Micaiah, the son of Imla. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Though I'm going to stop there because a lot of this is just repeated back in 1 Kings 22. So go back if you want to 1 Kings 22 because we're going to go over some of these things um, that was mentioned there. But I just wanted to show you how the Bible gives us the extra information about the relationship between Jehoshaphat and Ahab. And Jehoshaphat being the righteous king versus Ahab being the wicked king and him joining affinity and yoking up. And he even said, look, my people shall be as thy people. Like we're just going to be like one people. And this is, this is an attitude that you need to watch out for being, being a believer in Jesus Christ, that we're called to be separate from this world. We're not supposed to be yoking up together with the wicked people of this world just to accomplish some goal, especially to accomplish their goal, right? But we're, you know, God has called us to be a holy people, peculiar people, and, and separate from this world. We have no business yoking up with anybody else and I don't care what the reason is. I don't care if it's because, oh, well, they're, you know, if someone's really wicked and they want you to join up with them to do some, to, to, to do, help their cause, just because it's your in-law doesn't mean you should just be yoking up with them. We ought to love Jesus Christ more than, than everybody else and not compromise our position and our standards just to appease someone who's a, a relative or, a, you know, whatever. God comes first and adherence to his commands come first. Amen. And when you start getting involved, and especially, this, I mean, and this isn't just like doing some small favor for, you know what I mean? Where it's like not that big of a deal. Like, like you, he's helping him move from one palace to the other or something. You know, I mean, that's, that's not what's going on here. He's talking about going to war. I mean, people are going to be dying. This is a cause that you definitely don't want to be a part of. Look, God is the one that can lift people up and bring people down. Why would you want to sacrifice your men, your, your country, your, you know, your people, your lives for some wicked king? And this is what America as a whole needs to realize with all their foreign aid, going to all these wicked governments and wicked people that are that are literally going through and annihilating entire civilizations and we're funding them, we're supporting them and completely propping up their wars. And get, you know who that is? One of the big people that America's always for. Your people are like our people as a nation of Israel. And you know who it is in this story? The nation of Israel. But I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves because there's still a few more things I want to cover before we're going to get to the rebuke that Jehoshaphat receives. Because this is very applicable to us today. I mean, we, we read these stories and say, what, what can we learn from this? Well, one, we're going to learn not to yoke up with wicked people for any reason. Because that's going to end up causing you problems later in the future. You think, oh, I'm just innocent in all this. No, you're not. When you start yoking up with people, you're no longer innocent of the things that they do. You're joining together with it. Look at verse, go back, you're in 1 Kings 22. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. So Jehoshaphat is still the righteous king and he's saying, but he's got it backwards. He answers Ahab saying, well, I'm as you are, our people, your people. And then he says, hey, inquire at the Lord today. Now, right for Jehoshaphat to be asking to inquire of the Lord, because this is what the children of Israel are supposed to be doing. This is what God's people are supposed to be doing with everything is 
go to the Lord first, especially when you're going to have a battle. Hey, God, what should we do? Hey, God, should I go? I mean, David did this. It's recorded all throughout Scripture. Should I go or should I forbear? Hey, God, if I go over here, are these people going to deliver me unto Saul or are they going to protect me? And, and he goes to God with every decision he's going to make, every important decision. He's going, God, what should I do here? And God's leading him along. Every time he goes to God, God gives him the right answer. And when he doesn't go to God, it's a toss-up. Who knows what's going to happen? So we see here Jehoshaphat's going to the Lord. He said, hey, can we, can we get a prophet here so we could you know, communicate with God and, and, and get some direction here, get some guidance on how we ought to do this? He should have done that before he even yoked up with Ahab. Instead of answering him saying, yeah, of course, we're with you all the way. Verse 6 says, then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men. And said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to, the bat to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Now notice how many prophets. He called up 400 prophets that had no problem telling him, Yeah, you go, king. Go on. God's with you. God bless you. God bless Israel. We're going to win. God is with us. He's going to deliver you. They're nothing but a bunch of yes men. And we see this today, even in, you know, these are the, the God bless America, right? America can do no wrong. Everything America does is right. You're doing right, king. You're there, appointed by God, be king. God's going to be with you. You go ahead and you start any fight you want to, and God's going to be with you. And this is the attitude they have. You got to watch out because that's going to be the popular opinion. He got 400 prophets. And these were 400 prophets all claiming the Lord because Joshua wanted to inquire at the Lord. And it wasn't that long ago, if you remember, just a few chapters ago in 1 Kings 18, verse 19, when Elijah was standing all alone, right? And he, and he made the, the big to-do with the, the, the God that answers by fire. He's the God and, and he... he put up all the children of Belial and the prophets of Belial against himself and in that great story. Well, isn't it interesting that in this story, he was able to get 400 men. Just in case you don't remember the numbers from that, from that other story in 1 Kings 18, the Bible says, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Now, those were prophets of Baal. Those were prophets of the groves. They were not even claiming the Lord. But those same people, once, once that big event happened, right, and those specific people died, but all Israel said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And it was kind of like, everyone's like, okay, yeah, we're not going to do this Baal thing anymore. Well, at least not for a while. But this is still recent enough in history with that this had just happened not that long ago where every, you, know, you had this mass conversion to the Lord away from Baal. But all that means is that now you just have a lot of false prophets that are just saying, okay, well, we'll preach our religion under the name of the Lord. And that's what they're doing. And that's what people are doing today. People are taking the name of Jesus Christ. People are taking the name of Jehovah. People are taking the name of God and claiming to be a prophet of the Lord and just preaching out of their heart. Preaching for filthy lucre's sake. Preaching for whatever. Wolves in sheep's clothing. They come in and say, oh yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ, I'm a Christian. And just preach total work salvation. Preach all kinds of damnable heresies. And that's going to be the popular thing, unfortunately. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Keep your place here. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. See, when those false prophets of Baal were destroyed, the false, prophet, the, the false prophets then infiltrated quickly into, the, into the, the right religion that was only being represented by Elijah publicly. And even though that happened, there was still... I'm sure a large number of people in the population of Israel that still didn't want have anything to do with the Lord. They recognize that he's God, but see, they're like Burger King. They want God their way. 
It's like they want, you know, you want your burger your way, have it your way at Burger King, whatever. Because I think that's their slogan. They wanted, they wanted the, the church their way. They say, well, I, I, I you know, okay, God, the Lord proved himself to be God, but is this really all true about him? And, and they'll heap to themselves teachers. First, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 talks about this. Look at verse number 1. Now this is reference to the end times, but I think it's applicable through many times throughout history, uh, this being one of them. Verse number 1 of 2 Timothy 4 reads, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. This is what the prophets of God, the true prophets of God are going to do. They're going to remember, they're going to preach God's word. They're going to preach the word and be instant, in season, out of season. Whether it's popular or not, you're going to preach the word of God without compromise. You're going to reprove, you're going to rebuke, and you're going to exhort. You're going to tell people that they're wrong. You're going to tell them that they're wrong again. You're going to tell them what's right and, and help build them up with long suffering and with doctrine. You notice that the, the, the false prophets, the people that want to tickle people's ears, they don't have much doctrine at all. They're not teaching and, and supporting doctrine from Scripture. They're teaching their own doctrines and the commandments of men out of their own hearts without barely, usually even touching the Bible. Verse number three, though, says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So that, that I love this illustrative language, having itching ears, right? Their ears, it says a real itch. They just want someone to scratch. Like, oh man, yeah, that feels good. And the reason why I talk about his ears is because it's what they hear. They want to hear what feels good. They don't want to be told, thus saith the Lord, you're in sin. You need to repent. You need to get right with God. You need to start living a holy, separated life. You need to do what's right and get this sin out of your life. They don't want to hear that. They're saying, no, no that's not where my itch is. <laughs> my itch is over here a little bit. Keep out. Oh, God loves you. Oh, God's with you. Yep, keep doing what you're doing. You are doing great. There's nothing, nothing that you're doing is wrong. Keep it up. Keep up the good work. Hell's not really that hot anyways. You know, we're all going, we're all going to heaven. You, everyone just goes through a different path. That's the false prophets. That sounds good, right? I mean, who doesn't want to hear that? Oh, cool. There's no consequences for my actions at all. There is no judgment. We're all going to make it there. That sounds great. The problem with it is not true. And that's why it says that they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And I believe that this is, this is a common, I mean, this is definitely going to be happening in the last days because, you know, this, this is in context what this passage is talking about. But you can see aspects and elements of this throughout history where people just apostatize and really want to have nothing to do with the truth. This is something that happens, I believe it's pretty cyclical and it, and it happens, it recurs in, in um, nations and groups of people where they end up, I don't want to hear that. All I care about is, is just what feels good to me. And that's why the false prophets are so popular. That's why there's 400 of them as opposed to the one Micaiah. But see, Jehoshaphat was a god, like he was a righteous guy. He could hear these people and spot them and say, hold on a minute. And look at what he says here in verse number 7. Go back, if you would, to 1 Kings 22. Verse number 7. And Joshua had said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? No, no it's kind of funny because he had 400 prophets all saying the same thing. Joshua just kind of like, out of all the 400, he's just like, is there anyone else? Do you, do you have any other prophets that we could talk to about this? Because he recognizes, he said, this isn't what I was brought up with. This isn't what I know. This doesn't sound like a man of God. This just sounds like someone who's, who's a brown noser that's, that's just telling you what you want to hear. He could hear the voice of the shepherd. He knew that these guys weren't, weren't saying what was right. He said, well, I want to hear from someone a little bit better. So it says in verse 8, And the king of Israel said unto Joshua, There is yet one man. Notice that. There is yet one man. Micaiah, 
the son of Imlam, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Joshua said, let not the king say so. Now, this is the way that wicked people operate, like Ahab. He hates the guy who actually loves him. And the reason why we know that Micaiah loved Ahab is because he was preaching against him and preaching the truth that he needed to hear and he wasn't afraid to stand up alone and say it. See, when you love someone, you're going to tell them the truth. You're going to tell them the truth. Lies are never going to help anybody. It's not going to. It's going to give someone a false sense of relief or comfort if you're lying to them and not the truth because you know what? Every lie comes to light. You can never maintain a lie forever. It never happens. It all, God makes sure that the light always shines on the lies in this world. It, it happens without doubt. It's interesting, you know, I, I was, um, I've, I've seen a lot of those um, documentaries and like murder, you know, murder type documentaries and stuff where they talk about various serial killers and people like that. And it's like, no matter how smart someone is, no matter how much time they take to try to cover up all the tracks and all the lies they tell and everything that they do, it's like these people, even if it takes some time, it always comes to light. Like every single time, it's, you're going to be found out. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. It's going to happen. There is no escaping. There's no getting away from it. It's going to happen. And here we have Ahab saying that, you know what? I hate him. I hate him. For he, he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. I like Joshua's response. He's saying, no, don't, don't talk like that. You know, let not the king say so. Don't say that, king. I'm, I'm sure it's not that bad. And, um, you know, the Bible says in Luke chapter 6, this is how we know Micaiah is a man of God. Right, right off the bat, before we even hear what he's saying. Because if you got a wicked king Ahab saying he hates him and he never says anything good about me, well then you got a good, bold, righteous man of God right there. The Bible says in Luke 6, 26, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. And that's what we had, the false prophets saying, all 400 of them, right? Go up, yeah, you'll be just fine. Everything's going to work out great for you. But in verse 22 of Luke 6, the Bible says, Blessed are you when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Which is exactly, Micaiah fa falls into this category right here. He was hated of the wicked king Ahab, and his name's being cast out as evil. Why? For the Son of Man's sake. Because he preached what was true and what was right. Verse number 23 says, Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in, li in the like manner did their fathers unto the, fa unto the prophets. Look at verse number 9 now in 1 Kings 22. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither Micaiah the son of Imla. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat the king of Judah sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. Look, I mean, they made it all the way to the entrance of the, of the gates of Samaria before Josh finally said, hey, maybe we should inquire of God. He yoked up with them. They got all ready to go. And he's like, well, wait a minute. Before we actually start fighting, maybe we should go ask God. A little bit too late there, buddy. But, um, and we need to remember that too. You know, go to God early on and you wouldn't be getting yourself into problems. We're going to see a little bit later, what, again, real soon, what... Um, how God treats Jehoshaphat then. It says, And all the prophets prophesied before them. Verse 11, And Zedekiah the son of Canaanah made him horns of iron. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. So you've got this guy, Zedekiah, you know, making these great horns. I'm sure he's real charismatic, right? He's, he's got his props now. He's saying, yeah, with these horns, these, you're going to push them back. God's with you. You know, I've got this word from the Lord and you're going to prosper. These are the prosperity preachers of his time. You know, they're the Spocks to live long and prosper, to 
<laughs> to the wicked King Ahab. And it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you're serving the Lord. You're just, go ahead and prosper. God's with you. God bless you. Prosperity preaching is popular. It's real popular today. People, I mean, look at Joel Osteen's church. He's got the, the, the mega church of mega churches. Like the, the, the I mean, what, they, they see, meet in an auditorium that's like a, like a sports center. 42,000 42, seats. Well, that's the attendance. So that's probably seats even more than that. 50, 100,000, whatever. Yeah, 42,000 people in attendance of that one church. It's a prosperity preacher. He's not going to preach on sin. He doesn't even like to name sins. He won't even make a stand against sin. Because he's one of these prosperity guys that say, oh, everything's great. You can live your best life now. Everyone look at smiles. Like we're going to be happy and smiling all the time. Doesn't that sound good? And people eat it up. I mean, 42,000 of them just in that area alone was in like Fort Worth or something. Is he in Texas somewhere, I believe? Right, Texas? I don't know exactly what city, but he's in, he's in Texas. And, uh, and he got, he's got at least 42,000 in attendance at his church, let alone all the people that read his read books, listen to him online, watch him, on, you know, all that stuff. And then people defend him too. And they're like, oh, I love Joel Osteen. Yeah, because he's just, he's just scratching an itch you have on your ear. But he's lying to you. Right. And see, so people realized the lies that are coming out of this guy's mouth, I don't think you'd like them so much anymore. I mean, what good is, is, are those lies going to do, those feel-good lies? You know, I've used this illustration before where like your house is burning down and you're stuck inside and someone calls up and your neighbor calls you on the phone and saying, oh, how's it going? Good. Oh, I don't know if I told you how, how great you are and how blessed you are. You know, you guys got a great house and a great family. God bless it. You know, go back to sleep, get a good night's rest, you know, so you can do more work for the Lord tomorrow. Hang up without warning you and saying, hey, your house is on fire. Just telling you, oh man, did you guys do some extra work out there? Oh, it looks great. Instead of saying, it's burning down. It's burning to the ground. Get out of there. You need to change. You need to get out. You need to move. You need to do something or else you're going to be destroyed. And that's where the preaching on sin comes in because it's, it's a serious deal with God. I want someone telling the truth to me. I don't want to be lied to. I don't want everyone pretending like I didn't screw up my hair in the back and just saying, oh man, your haircut looks great. So like Brother Smasher told me, he's like, hey, you missed a spot back there. It's like, well, thanks, man, because I'll get that corrected now. Now that I know about it, I could fix it. But if everyone just said, oh, hey, everything looks just fine, then never, I'd be mean, walking around like a fool. Just would, <laughs> you look like an idiot back there. But no, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. But I mean, those are the types of things. You want to know when things are not right. You want to know what areas you need to fix. I mean, we should. And if we have a right heart and not just itching ears, we're going to want to know what area do I need to improve on. But if you just want someone to tickle your ears, they're, they're, they abound. There's, there's going to be the 400 to 1 ratio of false prophets and people that won't tell you anything compared to the one man of God that actually has the guts to get up and just say, thus saith the Lord. That's good. Yeah. Go and prosper. That's a, God bless America. USA can do no wrong. Look at verse number 13 there, 1 Kings 22. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good, thing, good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. So there's always going to be people. Notice that this guy, I mean, and it's real subtle, just coming in and saying, hey, look, I was called to come and fetch you. All the other prophets, they're saying good things. Why, why don't you just go ahead and say something good too? Why don't you just join them, you know, and not, not shake things up? There's no need to rock the boat, Okay. The king just needs some approval here. He just needs the rubber stamp. Can you just go in and just say what everybody else said and just agree with them? Can you just go along to get along, Micaiah? And watch out for this in your life because this is what people are going to try to do to you. This is what family members are going to try to do to you. Oh, can't you just... Can't, I mean, can't we all just go to the same, to the same church? Hey, everyone else is Mormon. What are you doing being a Baptist? Can't you, just, can't you just come with us to the Mormon church? Can't you just say that, you know, we're all going to be gods one day and just like everyone else is saying in our family? 
mean, whatever the case may be, whatever it is, we're all Catholic. Can't you just bow down to Mary with us? Like everyone else is doing. Why do you have to cause a stir? Why do you have to cause a commotion? Why do you have to say anything? And that's the way you're going to be attacked. And you know what's going to be tempting? To not say anything and just go along because you know what? It's a lot easier to just go along and not say something. Because when you actually speak up, when you actually say the truth, it offends people. Some people don't like it. And it causes some strife. And it might cause some, some, some mixed emotions and people get upset by it. But I'll tell you what, if you're going to do what's right, if you're not going to be like the 400 other false prophets, you're going to need to just say the truth. And if you actually love the people, you're going to tell them the truth. I like Micaiah's answer to him because he's trying to convince him, you know, just, just say what everyone else said. Verse 14, and Micaiah said, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. And that's the attitude that you need to have. Hey, whatever God says, that's what I'm going to say. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to say it's something else. I'm not going to say, thus saith the Lord, when he didn't say, say so. I'm just going to say what God said is the truth. And that's it. And that's where it lies. And that's the best position to take because if people don't like you for that, then it's just they don't like God. Because it's not your message. You're just the messenger. It is not your, you know, people say, oh, don't judge. I'm not even judging. If I just repeat the Bible, if I just quote scripture and say, God says not to do this, thus saith the Lord, you know, this is a sin. It's what God said. It's not me. Amen. It's not you. It's, it's, it's God. This is the stand that we need to be able to take. And you say, I love you enough that I'm going to repeat this to you. I love you enough, I'm going to give you the message that God has. The truth. Verse 15, so he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And this is just kind of funny. He answered him, go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Now, I think he was just being facetious here. I don't, I don't see Micaiah being like, like, you know, slipping in his faith and being afraid to say the truth to the king because we see the rest of the story, how it kind of plays out. I think, I think he's, he's like mockingly saying because all the other prophets were saying this. They saying, yeah, go, go ahead, king. Go on and prosper. Just that's what you want to do. That's what you want to hear. Go ahead and do it. Because... Look at his response. And this is interesting because my, this isn't Micaiah's first interaction with King Ahab. It's not like this is the first time he's ever heard from this guy. He knew who he was by name. He's like, well, there's this one guy, Micaiah, but he's always talking against me. Right? You get then Joshua, it's like, yeah, let's get him. Let's hear what he has to say. And the king said unto him, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? You know, why isn't he saying this to the 400 prophets? You know why? Because deep down he knows that they're all full of it anyways. It's not that difficult to spot the guys that are just sucking up and brown nosing and telling you what you want to hear and just flattering and, and just, just speak. You know, to, I, I'm still amazed that people like Joel Osteen have such a following. Because I've never gotten sucked. I mean, even when I was unsaved, it's just kind of like, how do you fall for this stuff? Right. Yeah. I mean, like, like, like he, he's, just, he's just like a salesman. I mean, he's just like, he's just trying to say, it's, it's, it seems so obvious to me that these people are just like, they're fake, they're phony. You ought to be able to spot right through that. And I think King Ahab can spot right through that because as soon as Micaiah starts giving him the phony answer, he's like, look, how many times did I tell you, just tell me what God said, just tell me the truth. But see, it's like on one hand, he wants them to tell the truth, but he doesn't want to hear it. Right. And people already have it made up in their minds, like Ahab did, because you know what? It didn't persuade him at all. It didn't change his mind on what he was going to do. Sometimes people just say, okay, yeah, fine. Just tell me what the, answer, well, tell me what the truth is. And then they reject it anyways. People come to you in another mind made up. A, a good example of this would be like with um, divorce and remarriage. And people say, oh, I want to know what God thinks about this. Should I do this? Because I really think that God wants me to marry this person. I really think this is what God's will is in my life. 
I really think that this is what I should be doing. And then you show them. And you show them what, what the Bible says and, uh, and that, how the Bible calls that him, you know, if you marry someone who's put away, that they're called an adulteress or an adulterer. And then it's like, oh, no, I want to, you know, that can't be right. And they don't want, and then they just do what they were going to do anyways. It's like they want to get validation for what they're doing and they don't really want to hear the truth. Don't be like that. Don't look just for validation in everything that you do. Look for what's right. And care more about what's right than you always being right. Or relying on your feelings. Well, I feel this is right. Yeah, but the Bible says this is. Well, then go with that. Verse number 17 now, now Micaiah is going to give him the real answer. And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Joshua, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? He said, Didn't I tell you this was going to happen? Verse 19, And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. And all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. So Micaiah is telling him this. He sees this heavenly vision. He sees God on the throne in heaven. He's sitting on his throne and says, all the hosts of heaven standing by him. His host is a big company. It's a lot of you know, people or beings, angelic beings, you know, around him at his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. This is a really interesting story. Look at this. Verse number 21. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. So here we have, and I, what I believe this is, is very similar to when Satan was approaching God about Job, right? Because we know that Satan is still not cast out of heaven. And Satan and his angels, which we would call devils or demons, have not been cast out of heaven either. So we have this lying this spirit comes out. Because we know it's a spirit. It's not just like, um, it's not some believer that's in heaven. This is a spirit that comes to God. And the Bible says that the angels are ministering spirits. So we have a spirit come before God. Now this, and this isn't even, like I don't even think this is a good spirit, but it's just, it is what it is, right? They have access to God and he says, here, here's what I'll do. I'll be a lying spirit. And God gives him leave. He, he, he condones it. He says, okay, go ahead and do that. He says, that's fine. He gave Job, or he gave Satan permission to attack Job. He allowed it to happen. Now, God always has a purpose behind everything that he does, but he's even allowing to use evil for his purpose. And here we have a lying spirit being used of God for his purpose. And his purpose was to bring judgment on the house of Ahab. That was his goal. He was already determined that, that Ahab is being judged from all of his past sins and that the prophecy that came against him was going to be true where He's gonna, his posterity is going to be cut off and he says that he's going to die and Jezebel is going to die and that the dogs are going to lick up their blood and the fowls of the air are going to eat them, right? That's what Elijah prophesied against them. And that, that's going to come to pass. So we, he see here this lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets and he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Verse 23, now therefore behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. Now, I don't see any reason why this can't still happen today. This does happen. This is where false prophets get a lot of their information from anyways. They're speaking maybe even supernaturally. They're receiving words, but they're not receiving words from the Lord. This is where like, the, you know, Joseph Smith, claimed to be talking to an angel and received all of this information to, to start the cult that's called the Mormon religion. 
I believe he probably did speak with an angel, but a fallen angel, that's a devil. The Bible says in Galatians 1, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. There's devils that go around and preach false gospels. Muhammad, he's another one who claimed to have an angelic vision and dealings with a demon. Now, he didn't call it a demon, but he thinks it's from heaven and thinks of a God. And it's not. I mean, it's a totally wicked religion. There, there's a lot of, of spiritual beings. Like we live in a world of physical and spiritual. And the battle that we're waging is a spiritual battle. The problem is we can't see it. So everything's taken by faith, and we need to fight this battle. We need to be in this battle, but it's not a physical one. The only way we're going to be able to combat this is, is spiritually with our walk and with our words, with the ideas, with, with the gospel, with the power of God going forth in people's lives to combat the, the influence, because this is a, a satanic influence on the false prophets, giving, telling them what to speak. And this is recorded in the Bible. So this is, this is the result of a lying spirit going to those false prophets and telling them, yep, go ahead and help them out. And they're influenced by them. And, and you know what? Even though that happened, Ahab still had his own free will. He could have, just, he could have chosen to, to believe Micaiah if he'd wanted to. If he recognized it as the truth, since he was, he was asking him for the truth anyways. If he would have just received it, and believed it, he could have forbore, forbear, forborn from going to the battle. Jehoshaphat should have. Jehoshaphat was the one knowing that these guys ain't even right. Can we get to listen to someone else? And then he finally hears someone and he's saying, oh, well, that wasn't very good. Verse number 24. I says, but Zedekiah, the son of Canaan, remember this is the guy that made the, the, the horns of iron, went near and smote Micaiah in the cheek. And said, which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? So he goes and smacks him. He punches him in the face. And he's mocking him, right? He's just, just aggressively intimidating, hitting him, mocking him. Oh, yeah, which way did the Spirit go? Oh, you think there's a Spirit talking through me? Yeah, I do. Because that's what I saw and that's what God told me. And, and look at it. I love his response. Look at verse 25. And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. Why? Because Zedekiah is just a big bully. That's what he is. He's a punk. He, he probably, was probably a cheap shot anyways, but he's a striker, right? He's, he's like a brawler. He's going and just hitting this guy because he didn't like what he said because he can't combat him with the word of God. So he has to just resort to punching him in the face. And this is what the false prophets want to do. They want to intimidate you and, and challenge you to a fight, right? Instead of just using the word of God and, and preaching it. And he's like, you know what? You're going to know which way that spirit went. You little man, when you go and hide yourself in your chamber, when you're all by yourself and all alone and you're terrified and you're petrified, you'll find out wh where that spirit went. You could put on this show in front of everybody else about how big and tough you are, but at the end of the day, You'll, fit, you'll find out when you go and hide yourself. Look at verse number 26. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison and feed him with bread of affliction and with water of affliction until I come in peace. Micaiah gets thrown into jail for preaching the word of God. Again, another sign of a great man of God. He's not afraid to, te to say what needs to be said, to say the truth, no matter what the consequences are. Look at verse 28. Micaiah said, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. And that's, that is an absolute true statement. Again, Micaiah is still quoting Scripture, essentially, by saying, You know what? If what I said is the word of the Lord and it doesn't come to pass, then I am not speaking the word of the Lord. And this happens multiple times. This happens with Jeremiah. This where he's saying that like, okay, you know, you guys, and it happens over and over and over again 
And it's like, how much does it take for the people to realize this is a man of God? Because everything he's saying is coming to pass. If you just listen to him instead of listening to the false prophets, you'd be good. And we know from this story, the king of Israel dies on the battlefield. He doesn't come back in peace. Now, unfortunately, hopefully they didn't listen to his commandment because Micaiah then is as he's put in prison until he comes back in peace. He never came back in peace. I don't know if he stayed in prison for the rest of his life, but you know what? He did what was right. If, that, if that's the price he pays, then you know what? He's at least going to go down being right with God and not backing down and not compromising. And who knows what type of... This had to have some impact on other people around him. Saying, wow, this is exactly what Micaiah said. And it's not what all these phony prophets said. Look at verse number 29. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And again, it's like, at least Jehoshaphat wanted to call a man of God, but what are you doing, Jehoshaphat? Finally, getting somebody who says not to go up, and this is what's going to happen if you go up. You know, the king of Israel is going to be scattered and destroyed. It's gonna, you know, I mean, the prophecy was against Israel. Thank, you know, it wasn't, maybe that's why Jehoshaphat's like, well, prophecy's not against me, so sure, you want to go on a suicide mission, go ahead. I don't know. I don't know what he was thinking, but I mean, if he really cared about about Ahab, he would have been like, you know, we shouldn't do this. But no, they had their mind set up. He had his mind made up when he said, yep, I'm just like you. We're going to battle. And then we'll try to just double check if it's okay with God. And if it's not, we'll just do it anyways. It's a bad attitude. It's going to give you a lot of trouble if you have that attitude. So here's the king of Israel. King of Israel hears this. And I think he's still worried about what Micaiah said. I think it still got to his heart and he realized... He's not in good shape. So here's his plan. Verse number 30. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, but put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. So he's thinking, now he's trying to be tricky and say like, well, if anyone's going to go down, Jehoshaphat can go down. Ahab's a wicked, conniving guy. He doesn't care about Jehoshaphat. He didn't care about him when he, when he invited him down and made the big feast for him. He just wanted something from him. He's using him. He just wants him to go to fight with him. That's all he cares about. And now he's saying, when he's prophesied against, he's saying, well, maybe he can take the fall for me. Yeah, you go dress like a king, and I'm just going to disguise myself and just pretend like I'm a regular soldier. And, and that's his way to, to try to get around this prophecy against him that he's going to die. And Jehoshaphat goes along with it very naively. Verse number 31, But the king of Syria commanded his thirty and two captains that had rule over his chariot, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. The king of Syria has it out for Ahab. And Ahab doesn't even know this, but this is what's happening behind the lines in the Syrian army, saying, You know what? I don't, I don't want you fighting with anyone else in this battle. You're going to go straight after the king of Israel because I, I want him dead. Verse 32, and it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him and Jehoshaphat cried out. So now they're saying, hey, he's dressed in his robe. He looks like a king. That's got to be the king of Israel because Syria probably didn't even know that he had gotten the help of Judah. And they're just like, well, he looks like the king. Let's go fight against him. And one other piece of information that we don't have from this story, but it's in 2 Chronicles. You don't have to turn there, but it basically says that God is the one that helps Jehoshaphat still. Even though he went in that battle, he still let the people know, because what we're going to see here is that, you know, Jehoshaphat cries out. Verse 33 says, And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel that they turned back from pursuing him. In, the, in the, the parallel passage, the Bible says that God basically is the one that let them know. That's how they perceived it is because God let them perceive it, that it wasn't who they were after. So instead of killing Jehoshaphat, because he wouldn't have been able to survive with, with all these, and these are the best, you know, these are the captains of the chariots. The chariots were one of the, the best military weapons at the time. So you're focusing your best people to get through, to get to the king you know, they were going in with that job just, you know, and they didn't care how the rest of the battle went because they were going after the king. But as soon as they figured it out, they're like, oh, wait, this isn't the king of Israel. They departed from him. They turned back. They didn't even fight with him at all. 
and uh, Jehoshaphat was spared. Verse number 34, but look at this. So they don't know where the king of Israel is. That's who they're after, but he disguised himself, right? So Ahab's probably thinking, oh, I'm getting away with this. Verse 34, and a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, turn thine hand and carry me out of the host for I am wounded. So you got this archer say, basically just going, you know, probably from a distance, just shooting at a venture, you know, just thinking like, yeah, maybe I could get, you know, shooting it out there, hoping to just get somebody, not really knowing because it's too, you know, too big of a difference, distance or whatever to, to really know what you're going to hit. Because usually you have a lot of archers that would be shooting, you know, all at once to, to, to hit as many people as possible, whatever. Well, he's just, he's drawing his bow at a venture and just shoots it. And that's the one that just, pierces and kills Ahab. Not a coincidence. You can't hide from God. You can't disguise yourself. You can't run away from God. Jonah tried to run away from God. You know, when, when God determines that, some, uh, that his, you know, his, he's going to make sure his will gets done. And especially with kings and things like that. You know, these big events. He, he commanded Jonah to go and preach his message to the, to the city of Nineveh. It was a very important message. And Jonah tried to run away, but he can't run away from God. There's nowhere you can go and you're going to run away from God. So God plagued him. Ahab thought he could disguise himself. I'm just going to hide. You know, God won't know what I'm doing. You know, maybe he'll overlook me. He knows exactly where you're at. And it, it, doesn't, have to be the, it doesn't have to be the chariots that get to him. It could just be some lone archer that for whatever reason decided to draw his bow and just shoot right then. Be sure your sin will find you out. Look at verse number 35. And the battle increased that day. And the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even. And the blood ran out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. And there went a proclamation throughout the host about the going down of the sun, saying, every man to his city and every man to his country. They were like, what was the, what was the prophecy? It said they were like sheep scattered. There, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. So that's what happened. Ahab died. The proclamation goes out about the going down of the sun. Every man to his city and every man to his own country. So they departed that battle then in peace when Ahab died. And it's exactly the vision that he saw. Verse 37. So the king died and was brought to Samaria and they buried the king in Samaria and one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria. Look at this. And the dogs licked up his blood. This is again fulfilling the prophecy that Elijah spake. And they washed his armor according unto the word of the Lord, which he spake. Now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did, and the ivory house which he made, and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Ahab slept with his fathers, and Ahaziah his son reigned in his stead. And Jehoshaphat the son of Asa began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was thirty and five years old when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and five years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shilai. And he walked in all the ways of Asa, his father. He turned not aside from it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for the people offered and burned incense yet in the high places. And Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Because prior to that, Israel and Judah were not at peace. But Jehoshaphat makes peace with Israel, with wicked King Ahab, by joining affinity with him, by, by being influenced by him and marrying his daughter. Turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 19. I just want to show you here now the rebuke because we're on, we're on to Jehoshaphat here in the, in the chapter. So Jehoshaphat goes to the battle. Ahab dies and everyone gets scattered. Jehoshaphat leaves. Everybody leaves. The battle's over, right? But God's got a message for Jehoshaphat. He should know better. He was the righteous king. And he did a lot of good things too. So even though Joshua did all these good things, he screwed up here. Verse number two of 2 Chronicles 19 says, And Jehu, the son of Hanani the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Joshua, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. 
Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves of the land and has prepared thine heart to seek God. So he's, being, he's getting a very stern rebuke here. He's saying, look, Jehoshaphat, you're not supposed to go and help the ungodly. The people that, that hate God, you don't yoke up with them. You don't join forces with them. You don't support their cause. It's completely against the cause of God. And this is where we're at today. As I mentioned earlier, in this country, we're yoking up with a bunch of wicked... Now, America itself is a wicked country. But we're supposed to be the ones that are proclaiming Christ and proclaiming the Lord. That's, you know, the heritage of this, of this country has been that way. But what do we do? We provide aid. We provide money. We provide military. We say, no, Israel, we're going to yoke up with you. And we're going to support you in whatever, whoever you want to fight over there against Syria. I mean, the wars between Israel and Syria, it's not an old thing. It's been going on forever. And as it was then, so it is now. Israel is still a wicked nation. A Christ-rejecting nation. Should we be helping the ungodly? It's funny because what, what the people, the Christian Zionists say, you know, that, oh, we're going to be blessed if we bless this nation of Israel is exactly opposite of what the Bible is saying right here. It's saying wrath is upon you from the Lord for helping the ungodly. You're not going to be blessed, America, by blessing Israel. You're actually going to get wrath upon you by helping the ungodly. It's what the Bible says. Let's finish up the chapter. We're almost done here. Verse number 45. So as Joshphat, one of the bad things, he ended up making peace with the king of Israel and, and yoking up with them and teaming up with them. But overall, he was still a righteous king. He did a lot of things that were really good. And it says in verse 45, Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. Now, I'm not going to go in depth in this. We're, we're pretty much done with the sermon. But it's just worth noting that it's in there. That he's, you know, the good thing, one of the good things that Jehoshaphat is praised for as it just gives this really brief summary in this chapter of the Bible where it's not mentioning very much at all, but it does point out that, you know what? Oh yeah, by the way, the remnant, the, the leftover Sodomites that Asa didn't quite get out of the land during his reign, Jehoshaphat came and, clean, and, and cleared them out of the land, got rid of them, they didn't, he didn't embrace them and welcome them in and, and tell them to have parades up and down the streets. He got them out of the land. He got rid of those wicked people. And he's praised for it. He took them out of the land. Verse 47, there, were, there was then no king in Edom, a deputy was king. Joshua made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold, but they went not, for the ships were broken at Ezion Geber. Then said Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, unto Jehoshaphat, Let my servants go with thy servants in the ships. But Jehoshaphat would not. So now we see here a little bit of a, I think, a change of attitude with Jehoshaphat in Israel. After Ahab died and he got rebuked, we see him now, I think, kind of distancing himself and saying, Yeah, no, we're not going to do this. We're not, I'm not going to yoke up with you to go and get this gold. Because that's what we want to do, build this navy of ships and go out and, and yoke up with Ahaziah. And uh, it says, Jehoshaphat would not, verse 50, and Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David his father, and Jehoram his son reigned in his stead. Ahaziah the son of Ahab began to reign over Israel in Samaria, the 17th year of Jehoshaphat king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam the son of Nebat who made Israel to sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked to anger the Lord God of Israel according to all that his father had done. So Israel is still in this state of going down the tubes, going down the toilet. They continue to have these wicked kings. And this is why the judgment ends up coming is because they get great men of God preaching and prophesying. They have no excuse. They had Elijah who's standing up, doing his work. They had Micaiah standing up against a king, proclaiming the word of the Lord. And the people just didn't want to listen. There's no one to blame but yourself for that. 
when you hear the truth, you hear the word of God and you refuse it and you reject it, hey, when bad things happen as a result then, you got no one else to blame but yourself. And God will give you chance after chance after chance and give you all these opportunities. But you know what? When you just don't want to hear it, you don't want to hear it. And unfortunately, that's how too many people are. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, your words and the instruction, all these stories about the, the, the reign of the various kings of Israel and Judah, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us to learn the lessons that we need to learn from these uh, passages and apply them into our lives today, dear God. I pray that you please help us to um, not be ignorant of your words, but to, to study them and and to um, really do good Bible studies, comparing all of the, the various passages together so that you can teach us and help us to learn all the things that we need to know. God, I pray that you please help us to be bold like Micaiah was, that even though um, he apparently was pretty much by himself, just like Elijah was by himself, dear Lord, that even if we have to stand alone, that we would stand alone, that we wouldn't compromise, that we wouldn't give in to the pressure of just going along to get along, but rather that we would just stand up and, and be solid in our own heart and our own stand to just say that I don't care what man can do unto me. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to preach the word of the Lord, dear God. Help us all to have that boldness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.